We arrive now at Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, and in your notes, page 74. And what we want to do in our lesson this morning is to consider why these tribes are listed out here the way they are. The first thing you'll notice here in your notes is I've simply listed the tribes in their order. We have them Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And the question is, why are they in this order? And a number of different proposals have been set forth over the years by commentators. And most commentators say it's unknown why they're in this order. One thing is for certain. We start with the firstborn son, Judah, who is the replacement of Reuben, the original firstborn. So Reuben is in second place. And we end with Benjamin. And as we saw, he who sits upon the throne is like a jasper and a sardius. Jasper is the stone of Benjamin. Sardius is the stone of Reuben or Judah. And thus... He who sits upon the throne is the archetype of humanity from the firstborn to the lastborn, from Judah to Benjamin. And so that much we can deduce from the list. The list includes all of Israel, which is in the image of him who sits upon the throne, who is like a jasper and a sardius, and all the stones in between, Judah and Benjamin and all the tribes in between. But I believe that we can do something much more with this that is significant. And that is, given the fact that Revelation is full of quadrilateral orientations, and given the fact that every time in the Old Testament that the tribes are listed, they're listed in four groups of threes, we are invited to consider if there are four groups of threes here. In other words, whether it's Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Because every time in the Old Testament the tribes are listed, or almost every time, especially in temple and tabernacle passages, they're set out in groups of threes. There is a relationship to the stones, and there is a relationship to the star signs, and there is a relationship of these tribes to what is said about them in the two prophetic passages when Jacob and Moses prophesy and give the qualities of each tribe. We have here humanity in 12 dimensions. And these qualities are put together and combined in certain ways. So the question is, if we break this up into four groups of three each, which would be our instinct if we were first century Jews reading this, do we come up with anything significant? Well, yes, we do right away. The middle tribe in each group has the colors of the stones of the four horsemen. Reuben has the red stone and corresponds to the red horseman and to the ox face. Naphtali, we've studied this, has the white stone, corresponds to the white horseman and the lion face. Levi has the green stone, the emerald, corresponds to the green horseman and the eagle. And Joseph has the black stone, the onyx, corresponding to the black horseman and the man. And we have looked at that in detail over the last several weeks. The colors of the horses come from these stones. The horses are the church, ridden by Jesus, and each of the colors represents humanity or the church in one of her four dimensions. First, the white of conquest, then the red of dividing up family members against one another, and then the conflict, conquest and in conflict, then the black horse of the sacraments, bread and wine, and Joseph is in charge of that, and then finally the green horse of Levitical judgment against the false priests. And Levi is in charge of that. Now this is a different order. Instead of white, red, black, green, we have red, white, green, black. They're switched. So we have to go over here to page 75 and we begin to explore this in a little bit more detail. We're told that there are 12,000 in each of these tribes. We're told there are 144,000 total. And then we're specifically told in what might have even seemed a bit wearying to you, 12,000 in the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 
and so forth. Why? Why not just say 12,000 from each tribe and enlist the tribes? Why do it this way? Well, once again, we have to become Jews. We have to have the Old Testament memorized. We have to have grown up with it ever since we were little kids and have heard in the synagogue every Sunday five or six extended lessons read as the appointed lessons for each of the 52 Sabbaths of the week carried us through the Pentateuch, carried us through Isaiah, carried us through the Psalms, and we got that. And we also studied in synagogue school hour after hour. And so we knew what was in the book of Numbers. And we knew that in Numbers, when God called His host together, He numbers them. And it's all laid out exactly like this, twice in Numbers as the host is numbered. And this is what it sounds like. Now the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go to war, their numbered men of the tribe of Reuben, 46,500. Of the sons of Simeon, their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, its numbered men, according to the number of names, head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war, their numbered men of the tribe of Israel, 59,300. Of the sons of Gad, their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war, their numbered men of the tribe of Gad, 45,650. Of the sons of Judah, their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war, their numbered men of the tribe of Judah, 74,600, and so forth. Everyone the same way. That's how you do a census. That's how you do a muster of an army when it's called together. And then it's summarized over here in chapter 2 that these armies are laid out in four positions, north, south, east, and west. We've looked at that. They're arranged around the tabernacle, and we're about to see it again. But that sounds like this. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben by their armies, the leader of the sons of Reuben, Elizur, the son of Shedeur, and his army with their numbered men, 46,500. And those who camp next to him shall be the tribe of Simeon, and the leader of the sons of Simeon, Shalumiel, the son of Zurishaddai, and his army, even their numbered men, 59,300. Then comes the tribe of Gad, and the leader of the sons of Gad, Eliasaph, the son of Deuel, and his army, even their numbered men, 45,650. That's chapter 2 of Numbers. Then chapter 3 does this same thing with the Levites and breaks them all up into families and does it again in Numbers chapter 4. And then Numbers 26, we have another numbering of the sons of Israel. At least it's not as complicated as the previous one and is a little bit easier to read in some ways. It gives more description like this. The sons of Naphtali, according to their families, of Jaziel, the family of the Jazielites, of Guni, the family of the Gunites, of Jezer, the family of the Jezerites, of Shelem, the family of the Shelemites, these are the families of Naphtali. According to their families, those who were numbered of them were 45,400. That's how you do the mustering of an army, and that's what this is. See? Now, when we come to this, we instinctively know that we're given 12,000 from each tribe because these are the four winds of the land. Remember, the four winds of the land are the army of saints. They're being held back. Part of the reason they're being held back is that they're being constituted during this 40-year period of time. And there's going to be 12,000 from each one. And what we've got here is a war camp. And the war camp is going to be set up on the four sides of the tabernacle or temple. And what do you know? The central tribe in each of these lists corresponds with one of the four faces and one of the four directions. So now here on page 75, we can draw it all out, and now we know what's being said. On the north side of the tabernacle is the table of bread and wine, and that's associated with the man-faced cherub, and that's associated with the black stone and the black horse. And so that's where we're going to put Joseph with Zebulun and Benjamin next to him. On the east side is the ox face, which is associated with the altar and the red horse, and that's where Reuben, Judah, and Gad are going to be. On the south, we have the lampstand, which is the eagle face, and that's associated with the green horse, the emerald of Levi, 
Issachar, Levi, and Simeon will be there. And finally, on the throne side, Naphtali, the bride who sits on the throne next to the king. That's the lion face and the white horse, the ark, and with Naphtali's Manasseh and Asher. And now we have a complete configuration. We have the army, and the army is positioned exactly where it would be. Now, this is not the same configuration as in Numbers 2 when the army is set out. This is a new configuration for Revelation. But since we know the Old Testament so well, we instinctively recognize that there are four groups of three, and then we see that it's an army. We see that the symbolism goes with the four directions, and this all just falls out. Or so it seems to me, and that's how I'm going to go with it. So there is a parallel between the four horsemen who ride out and the four winds of heaven who were the saints and the four companies of Israel, which will be joined by a vast mixed multitude. Now, since these are armies of praise and prayer, they face inward. They face inward by implication toward the throne. The man face faces south and the eagle face faces north. And so usually we draw the eagle in the north, facing north, and the man in the south. But if you do it with the tabernacle, remember, the eagle starts at the lampstand and moves north. The man starts at the showbread and moves south. That's the way it is here. They're all pointing inward to the throne because these are armies of prayer. Warfare is conducted through prayer in Revelation. That is how the wind is set loose. The wind of the Holy Spirit is set loose by the prayers of the saints. And it's restrained right now, but when the full number of the saints is given, then that wind will go out. The order of praise is not the same as the order of evangelism and conquest. Now, that's why I'm saying this. The order of evangelism and conquest is white horse, red horse, black horse, green horse. First, the gospel goes forth, white horse. It divides people up, father against son, mother against daughter. That's the red horse. Then God decapitalizes the wicked but preserves the sacraments for the saints. That's the black horse controlling bread, wine, and oil. Then comes the final judgment on the wicked culture. That's the green horse of Levitical judgment with death following. That's the order. That's what happens every time the gospel goes somewhere, and that's what's happening here at this stage in history. That's the order of evangelism. White Red, black, green. But the order of prayer and praise is different. It is red, white, green, black. And that's why the arrangement is different. Now, let's see what we can do quickly looking at each one of these armies. While I also should say that this is the order of history as well. If we go from ox to lion to eagle to man... That's the order of history. The ox is a mosaic period, priestly. The lion is the kingly period with David. The eagle is the prophetic and imperial period with the world empire and the prophets. And the man is the new covenant. That's the order of history, and that's the order that we have here in this section with these four prayer armies. So let's look at them briefly. And it will help you again to... Look at your notes where these things are charted out. What we have to do is pull together the meaning of each tribe. Each tribe has a meaning. Each tribe has a particular stone. Each tribe has its star sign, which we've discussed. Each tribe has its description by Moses. Each tribe has its description by Jacob. And we could probably look at the specific history of each tribe and all the things that happened with each one, but this is enough, okay? This, this is enough for us. Oh, and each tribe has its name. And when Leah and Rachel give names to their sons, they give them specific names that mean things. In every case, that's very carefully given to us in Genesis. And so that's the information that goes to the quality of each tribe and why certain tribes are grouped with others at certain stages in history by God. That's the revelation that's here. Judah, Reuben, and Gad are carbuncle, sardius, and hyacinth, two red stones and a violet one. Judah is the lion, Reuben is the man, and Gad is the archer in the sky. We've discussed that and their association with the horses. Judah means praise, Reuben means behold a son, and Gad means good fortune. 
now put this together. First of all comes the altar. And this is Reuben and Judah and Gad on the altar side of the fourfold orientation. This is the Mosaic period. This is the period of conquest and occupation. Moses leads to Joshua and to Judges, and it's the period in which the land is conquered. And this red horse of war, real war, is the first one and is associated with the Mosaic period. If we look at the star signs, the archer and the lion are the only warriors in the zodiac. There are no other warrior signs, and they're both here in this section. Judah is named first because in the Bible, Judah leads in praise and in war. If you read Judges, Joshua, other passages, you'll find that Judah is always the one who goes first, and Judah is the ruler. Now, Reuben is named unstable by Jacob, so there's a judgment against him. But Moses says, may Reuben live and not die, and may his men not be few. And both of those things refer to military might. Jacob says that Gad is a raider. And Moses says that Gad is a lion and a ruler and a leader. So the warrior motif is in all three of these tribes. And as we'll see, they're the only tribes that really have a strong warrior motif associated with them. They go with the red horse of war and they come first in the Mosaic period. They're the ones who offer praise at the altar because the altar is where things are killed. And that's where it starts. Praise and prayer starts with death. It starts with the holy war against our own sins. You want to make this personal? Beat up yourself first. Come in here and confess sin. And we have to deal with the problem of sin and wickedness before anything else can happen. So we start at the altar. Then comes the white horse of the lion host. The three lion tribes in this configuration associated with the white horse as the four winds of the land, are Asher, Naphtali, and Manasseh. And Asher is the brown agate, Naphtali is the clear diamond, very important in Revelation. And Manasseh, we get the sapphire from the tribe of Dan. Asher is the scales, Naphtali is the virgin, and that's why the white horse comes first, the virgin bride on which Jesus rides. And Manasseh is the lamb. Asher means happiness, Naphtali means one who wrestles. Reminds us of Jacob wrestling with God. And Manasseh means that you forget your trouble. Okay, let's look at this. The throne comes second. We move from the altar to the throne. The bride is the one on the throne here. She's a lioness. She's Naphtali, the virgin. This is the kingdom period. A time of peace and prosperity. Wrestling, Naphtali. Leads to happiness, Asher. And you forget your troubles, Manasseh. Those are the ideas associated with this second group, the kingdom period. It's conquest. In Revelation, it's the Lamb who has overcome. Remember in Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and following, the angel says the lion from the tribe of Judah has overcome to open the book. And then John turns around and it's a lamb. The lamb is the overcomer. Remember that Asher has royal food. The scales of Asher are associated with the black horse, Joseph, who's in charge of bread and wine. The black onyx horse has Asher's scales with him. And Asher has royal food and is favored with oil and walks leisurely, according to Moses. And that's the way the Christian conquest of the world is. That's the white horse riding forth to conquer. It's not so much riding forth in a military sense as it is a leisurely walk. Because Christ is already conquered and time is on our side. Naphtali, preserving the feminine imagery. Naphtali is a doe set loose who gives beautiful words. Remember that the great Naphtalite doe who gave beautiful words was Deborah. In the song of Deborah. That's what Jacob says. And the beautiful words are the means by which the white horse conquers. Not with a sword but with the sword of the word. Naphtali is blessed by God and conquers to the south and to the sea, according to Moses. And finally, Manasseh. Manasseh has to inherit Dan's place. Jacob says Dan will judge and be a serpent to his enemies. We'll find in Revelation that the saint army has serpent tails on it, and so that will connect here. Moses doesn't bless Dan. seems that Moses already saw some trouble on the horizon there. 
But Moses does say that Joseph will push with ox horns and Manasseh is one of the Joseph tribes and that Joseph, Manasseh and Joseph will drive the heathen to the ends of the earth. We have a second set of ideas here. The first one was of war and conflict, the red horse. This one is of easy rule and conquest. We walk. We're a doe set loose, giving about beautiful words and, and conquering that way. That's the second dimension of the four winds of the land under control of the four angels riding out with the four horses, God's heavenly host. Now we come to the eagle host, which is associated with the green horse. And of course, Levi is central here. He has the emerald. He's the green one. We have Simeon, Levi, and Issachar. The yellow topaz, the green emerald, and the violet amethyst. Their star signs are goat and eagle. We take the eagle from Dan. And the crab. And their names mean, Simeon means God has heard me. Levi means I'll be attached to my husband. Issachar means God has given me my wages. That's how they were named. Okay, and in our tour of the tabernacle, we've moved from the altar to the throne. Now we go back to the lampstand, the eagle. This is the third period of history, the cosmopolitan era, in which witness to the heathen is highlighted. The prophets are always sending letters to the pagan nations. We move from priest to king to prophet. The prophets start to really deal with the heathen world. And the eagle in the Bible is both the prophet and the world emperor. And so this is after the exile, the cosmopolitan period of Old Testament history. And so it comes third. The meanings of the names point to the fact that God hears the cry of the saints because he's attached to them and he gives the wicked their wages. Now, that's all over Revelation. We've just been studying that. God hears their cry, how long, O Lord? He hears it because he's attached to us and he's going to give the wicked their wages. Well, what are those wages? Well, goats, eagles, and crabs are all scavengers. And they're the only scavengers in here. The only three warrior star signs were with the red horse, and the only scavengers are right here with the green horse, which is the eagle. And in the book of Revelation, the eagle who flies in mid-heaven is the one who is called to eat up the dead army of corpses. And so the dead bodies of the wicked after the battle are eaten up by land, sea, and air. From the heaven above comes the eagle. Down on the earth beneath comes the goat. And up from the sea comes the crab to eat the dead bodies of the wicked. Do you see how this associates? See, when you see all these correspondences, you realize you probably got a handle on what's going on. At least I think I do. Now, Jacob, as far as the prophecies are concerned, we don't have a whole lot. Jacob denounces Simeon and Levi because they attacked and killed the Shechemites. And Moses doesn't say anything about Simeon. Moses blesses Levi for killing the wicked and says that his incense will cause God to destroy his enemies. Notice that the rising incense in Revelation is what calls forth judgment on the wicked. Issachar, Jacob says, Issachar is a willing laborer who virtually makes himself into a slave in his hard work. He works so hard that he's virtually a slave to his work. Moses says that Issachar will draw the heathen to God from the sea, and that they will offer sacrifices instead of being killed. Well, this association here then is more of work and prayer than of conquest and war. This third phase, this third dimension of the army, the 12,000 of each tribe, the 144,000 army that are the four winds of the land that are called up by the four angels that are associated with the four horses that are under control of the rider of the four horses, who is Jesus. Jesus rides on each horse. All four riders are Jesus. This is the prayer and work dimension. Hard work and prayer. Levi's prayer, Issachar's hard work. Because God hears us, He's attached to us, and He answers our prayer by calling up the scavengers to eat the dead bodies of our enemies. Finally, we have the black horse and the man host. The last three tribes page 77. That's Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Joseph is the onyx stone. 
Joseph is the bread and wine. Zebulun is blue turquoise. Joseph is a black onyx. And Benjamin is the red or crystal clear jasper. Zebulun's star sign are the twins. Joseph's star sign is the bull. And Benjamin's is the fish. Zebulun means honor. God has honored me. Joseph means added. May God add one more to me. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. That's the initial information that we are putting together into, we're baking all that into one cake, the cake of the black host. That cake look, how does it taste when we combine this stuff and say, what picture do we get from that? The table of showbread is the last of the four items of furniture. We've gone from the altar to the throne to the lamp to the table, from the ox to the lion to the eagle to the man. Or to the bride, really. The man is the priest who's doing all this. And the bride is the twelve tribes, the twelve loaves, and the wine. Of course, that's Joseph. Joseph is in charge of bread and wine. And this is what comes last, and this is the new creation. What period of history is this? This is the period of the image of God, man himself. No longer an animal face, but the man face. The face of God, God's image. And it's bread and wine that are the gift of the new creation. And remember, the whole point of the book of Revelation is to form a table of showbread. We start off with this vision of the heavenly temple, and we have everything except the table of showbread. What Revelation is doing is it's gathering together wheat and wine, and it will harvest them and make a table of showbread here in the book. That's the drama. Well, the names of the sons. God adds honor to the sons of his right hand. If you want to combine those names, we are the sons of the right hand in union with Jesus, and God adds honor. The twins, the star sign of the twins like the fish are associated with the sea, and that's in the Bible. Acts 28, verse 11, Paul says they traveled on a ship that was under the sign of the twins. And here again is a reference to the star signs in the Bible, which is what opens up the possibility of reflecting on them with the twelve tribes as we have done at the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered at the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. Now, oh, let me ask you a question. You're reading along in Acts 27 and 28. You know, Paul gets on the seashore and they build a fire and a snake comes out and bites him and it doesn't kill him. They heal some people and then they're going to travel on to Rome. And Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says at the end of three months... Okay, that's always significant, right? Three days, three hours, three months. So we understand that. We set sail on an Alexandrian ship. Who cares if it's an Alexandrian ship? Why does God want us to know that it's an Alexandrian ship? I have the foggiest idea. It could have just said we set sail. Then it says that the ship had wintered at the island. Well, we could figure that out for ourselves. Does it add anything? I don't know. Which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. Are we told what the figurehead was on the other ships in the Bible? It does it say Jonah went to Tarshish on a ship that had, you know, Venus as a figurehead, you know, a lady out front? No. This is the one place in the Bible where we're told about the figurehead on the ship. I don't know why the Holy Spirit provides this information, but I know it's not an accident. Now, I don't know if we were studying Acts instead of Revelation. I'd figure out something to say about it. But I'm not going to worry about it. All I want you to see is that here we have a reference to the star sign. And as a matter of fact, from what I can tell, from what we can tell, it's the star sign of Zebulun. And like the fish, it's associated with the sea. The twins are protectors of sailors. And the bull is associated with the land. Now, Jacob and Moses both say that Zebulun will locate at the seashore and be a safe haven for the Gentiles and their ships. And so the association of Zebulun with the twins makes sense. It makes sense that that's their star sign because it fulfills exactly what both Jacob and Moses say about Zebulun. Jacob and Moses say that Joseph is a fruitful bough giving much food and blessed by God. Well, of course, Joseph is the food king. I mean, he fed the world bread, and he had the silver cup of wine for Pharaoh. He is the Lord of bread and wine. So that fits. And finally, with Benjamin, 
Jacob says that Benjamin is a hungry wolf devouring prey and dividing spoil. In a sense, he's the reverse of Joseph. Joseph gives food to everybody. Benjamin is the flip side. He is a wolf who takes food. Both of those things happen in history. We have to be both warriors and charitable, depending on the circumstances. And Moses says that God gives security to Benjamin and carries him on his shoulders like you would carry a lamb or like you would carry a little kid. Put your kid up here and carry him along. You know, kids want to be carried on your shoulders. By kid, I mean child, okay? But a baby goat kid or a lamb you would carry on your shoulders too, and God will take care of Benjamin that way. Well, that's the fourth dimension then of the wind army. We've got 12 groups of zephyrs, 12,000 zephyrs in each of these 12 tribes, 36,000 zephyrs in each of the four winds. And you get 36,000 zephyrs together and you have pretty good wind. This is one of those great big fans that you can get at Sam's that you know blows everything out of the room. And there are four of them, and this fourth one here then is associated with the sacrament and with safety and protection. And that is also the association. By the way, that associates with the black horse. Remember that we saw the oil and the wine are protected while the bread is made scarce by the black horse. The church is protected while the wicked are decapitalized. And here the idea of protection is again associated with this host. Now, the details are here, and next week when we have our quiz, you'll be expected to fill out all the blank spaces on this, right? No, yeah, I can't ask you to do that. But what you need to take away from this is that you are part of this prayer army. And at different phases in our lives, we may be involved in praying for God to bring judgment on the wicked. Or we may be involved in praying for God to give us a place to walk and take the gospel with us so that we're a doe let loose. Or we may be involved in praying to God to bring scavengers to eat the dead bodies of the wicked. Or we may be involved in praying to God to provide bread and wine and give us security. That's all what this prayer army gathered around from the four directions of the tabernacle with their four faces. That's what they're asking for. And as these prayers go up to heaven, the wind is being held back. But soon the army will be formed and the wind will be let loose. And the land and the sea and the fruit on the trees, the demonic host, the angelic host, are all going to be changed when those four winds are finally let loose. That happens now. Right now, I would say that the church in the United States of America and in the world is in really bad shape. The church is not 12 groups of 12,000 each. It's in chaos. She's in chaos. What we need is to ask God to form us up so that we become once again a good prayer army. And when we become a prayer army, when the church is reformed, and the prayers go up, and after a while, the land, the sea, and the trees will be changed. And as long as the church is as messed up as she is, that won't happen. So our first responsibility is to ask God to bring about a restructuring of the church and make us into this fourfold army. Well, I hope that I've given you enough in your notes to where as you read over this again and think about it some more, it will give you some thoughts to meditate on and help you to understand who you are better and who we are better in the kingdom of God. Because this is us. It's all us. We're the new Israel, and all of these qualities and characteristics are our qualities and characteristics now. Let's stand and pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have called us into the privilege of being in your army. Thank you that this army is an army of prayer that even if the churches are shut down by brown shirts in our government, and even if we're persecuted and forced to live in sewers and catacombs, we have all the power necessary to bring about change because we have your ear. That in spite of the good things that can be done in our society because of our freedom, that the essential power is always there. You have given us a power that simply can't be taken away by anybody because it's the power to talk to you. We have the mark on the forehead that makes us all high priests. We can go any time. 
Father, we have to confess that we don't really appreciate this very much and we don't use this privilege very often. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to us to stimulate us to make use of it better and help us to participate in what it means to be your prayer army gathered around your throne. Help us to have all 12 of the qualities of these 12 tribes and that we would stand for you, before you, and for you before the world. We ask now that you bless us as we offer ourselves to you along with our tithes and gifts. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Sovereign Lord. Amen.